Our gracious, eternal, loving, heavenly Father, we thank thee for this, the return of thy day. We thank thee for a lovely Sabbath morning in which we can come to worship and praise thee, our living God. We ask, Lord, that thou would bless every head that's bowed in thy presence. Pray, Lord, that thou would remember every family and every individual. And, O oh God, that thou would draw near and minister to each of our hearts. Shut us in, Lord, therefore, with thyself. Help us to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We pray these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Psalm 103, and we'll stand to sing the first seven verses, please. O thou, my soul, bless God the Lord, and all that in me is, be stirred up his holy name to magnify and bless. Page 94, if you have the hymn book, uh, Psalm 103, we'll stand to sing first, verses 1 to 7. And just let's unite our hearts together, please, in a word of prayer, and seek the Lord's blessing this morning. Our gracious, eternal, loving, heavenly Father, we do continue in thy presence in the Saviour's precious and all-prevailing name. Thank the Lord that we are bidden to come boldly unto the throne of grace, to obtain mercy, and find grace to help in every time of need. And Lord, we praise thee today at thy right hand is the ever-living Saviour, the great intercessor and our high priest, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord today that uh, he was to be obedient to the Father's will. And when the fullness of time was come, he came and was born of that virgin, walked amongst men, the sinless Lamb of God, that one day he might ascend Golgotha's brow and there lay down his life for sinners and rebels like we. And oh, we thank thee today for that once for all sacrifice for sin. 
We recognize, Lord, that Easter Sunday is not the only Sunday that reminds us of the empty tomb, but every Sabbath, every Christian Sabbath reminds us that the work is finished and we worship one who's alive, one who is glorified, one who is reigning on the throne of God above. And we acknowledge that thou art God today and we bow in humble adoration before the only God of heaven and earth. And we thank the Lord for thy goodness even toward us in the week that has passed. Lord, thou hast been gracious to us. Thank thee for thy preserving grace. Thank thee for thy keeping grace. And, O oh God, we bless thee for saving grace. And we pray that thou would work on even in these days. O oh God, thou hast been good to our congregation. Thank thee, Lord, for raising up those that have been laid aside, even with the virus. And, Lord, we pray that thine hand will be upon each one. And, Lord, thou would continue to protect us in these days. We thank thee for those that have come in again to the house of God, for those, uh, Lord, who have come back even for the first or second time. And, Lord, we praise thee, Lord, for your hand upon each one. And we ask the Lord today that thy might, Lord, do us good, and thy presence will be known in our midst. And, O oh God, thy speaking voice will be heard uh, to our souls today. Uh, we would say, Lord, that thou would, uh, Lord, speak, for thy servant heareth. And, O oh God, we cry to thee that there might be that word in season to us. Father, do remember those, again, who have been bereaved in past weeks and days. And we ask, Lord, that thou would, the God of all comfort, draw near and minister unto their every need. Oh, we thank thee, Lord, thy grace is sufficient. And, Lord, there's those who have been bereaved in their own congregation of late. And we thank thee for help given. Continue it, Lord. We do remember our monarch today. Remember our queen. And we ask, O oh God, that thou would accept of her thanks for her long reign. But, O oh God, at this, uh, her time of great need, the passing of Prince Philip, we pray that thou would draw near. The God of all comfort would minister unto her, her heart. And Lord, that thou would be pleased to uh, work in her family. Oh, we think of Charles today and Anne. We think of Andrew and Edward. And Lord, how we can say that sin has ravaged in that family. And oh, Father, we cry at this time where they have the passing of their father. That Lord, today would look uh, to the God of heaven, the God of all comfort. And Lord, we pray the work of grace might be done even in hearts in that family. We pray, O oh God, for William and Kate today. And we ask, Lord, that thou would meet with them. And Lord, Harry as well. And, O oh God, we cry that thou would bless Megan. Lord, draw near and minister unto them. There are so many, Lord, throughout our nation, and they need thee. And we pray, Lord, that thou would be gracious unto our nation at this time. And, O oh, we pray that... Where there has been death, where death is covering the uh, front pages of the newspapers. We pray, Lord, there will be a softening of hearts. We pray, oh God, there will be a consideration of the latter end. And men and women might be wise. They might seek the Lord while he may be found. Oh God, step in, we pray. Lord, come thyself. Lord, no words of a preacher can do it. But oh God, thou... Ask the power. Speak the word, Lord, and it shall be done. And we pray that thou would turn our nation even back to God again. Remember our province in all its need, in all, Lord, of its sin and iniquity. And we pray, O God, that thou would, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. Remember those and uh, rule over us. O God, we pray, even, Lord, again in the assembly this week, that thou would deal a blow to this conversion therapy discussion. Lord, how we can see that there are those who are seeking to um, make it a, an offense to pray with someone who has sinned in their life. And we ask, O oh God, that thou would deal a blow to even the sodomite agenda. And Lord, for those liberals who would seek, Lord, to silence the preacher in the open air, Lord, we cry, thou would have mercy, that thy word would run and be glorified indeed, Lord, that was what we pray for our land. 
that his godly heritage might be preserved. And Lord, that the preaching of the word would be able to go unfettered. Oh God, come Lord and deal at this time. I know us, Lord, what's, what's going on behind the scenes. And we thank the Lord we come to one who can expose the hidden things of darkness. And so, Father, we do spread the need before thee. We leave these problems and issues with thee. And we ask, Lord, that thy will will be done. Strengthen thy church, Lord. Strengthen thy people. Oh, God, we pray that thou might strengthen us in these days. I would increase our faith and that our gaze might be upward even to God. Hear their cry. Remember those that are able to listen in. And Lord, join us by other means. Pray, Lord, that thou would draw near to them, that every family and home might know uh, thy presence at this time. Remember Brother George again. Thank thee for your hand upon him this week and the little improvements. Pray, O God, and I will, uh, that he might get out home. Remember Elmer. Uh, Lord, bless her. Help her. Touch her, O God. Linda and Ruth and Ronald and O God, Barbara, Diver, draw near to them. And we pray that thou would be with them, Lord, at this time. So, Father, answer our prayer. Abide with us. As we turn to thy word, give us help and give us understanding. Come by thy spirit and draw our hearts out after thyself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn this morning uh, to two passages, actually, this morning, but Genesis 36. First of all, I want to read some verses from there. And then if you can find the book of Obadiah, just after Amos and before Jonah, we want to read some verses from there as well. Genesis 36, and the words of verse 1, is where we're going to commence our reading this morning. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholabamah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. And Adah bare to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashamath bare Ruel, and Aholabamah bare Jerush, and Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance which he had got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. For their riches were more than that they might dwell together. And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Amen, just ending there. And then turning over to Obadiah. Again, just let's read some of the opening uh, verses in this, uh, one of the minor prophets. It's just before the book of Jonah. The vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen, Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves come to thee of robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they have enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom? And understanding out of the mount of Esau, and thy mighty men of Teman shall be dismayed, to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence 
against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Amen. Just ending our readings, uh, ending there at the end of verse 10, uh, knowing the Lord himself will add his own divine blessing upon the reading of his precious infallible word. Let me welcome you in the Lord's great name. It's good to see you again in the house of God. Uh, we do welcome each and every one, particularly those who have come out maybe for the first time. And it's good to see your families uh, coming back in, individuals coming back in again. We do welcome those uh, in the prayer meeting room as well, and those that are listening in through their various other means. And we pray the Lord might draw near and bless each one uh, as we come around his word this morning. Do remember a few announcements, please. Uh, this evening, half past six is the time of prayer to about 10 to 7 in the prayer meeting room. If you can, come that little bit earlier. And then the evening service at 7 o'clock. We've entitled the message tonight, A Cold Church. A Cold Church. Trust you'll be back. And uh, it's good to see visitors in, even last Sunday night as well. We trust we have the same again this evening. Then Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, is the prayer meeting and Bible study. And it's here in the church. We'd like to see the prayer meeting built up uh, in these weeks. And do your best, please, to come out to the place of prayer on Tuesday night. Then Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, sees the uh, recommencement of the children's meeting in the complex. And uh, parents, please remember that. And so do uh, pray that the Lord will undertake uh, for the children's meeting workers. 7 o'clock, Wednesday in the complex. Thursday night, we have one of our other uh, fellowship times, or fellowship hours, whatever you want to call it. And we've had some of these in the last, uh, during the lockdown in particular, uh, connecting with some of our own people and some missionaries. And God willing, this Thursday night at 8 o'clock uh, via Zoom, we'll be connecting with Dave DeCanio in the land of Liberia. So maybe you'll remember that and uh, get the details uh, from the last time. It's still the same, and you can be part of that meeting. Friday night, 8 o'clock, Youth Fellowship is in the complex as well, young people. And I do trust that you'll get the message out to other youth and that we'll join on Friday night. Saturday night, half seven, the open air continues in the lower square. Then next Lord's Day, uh, we have the service usual times, 12 and 7, the early morning prayer meeting, 9 o'clock in the complex, uh, the Sunday school, uh, 10 to 11, as it commenced again this morning. So do please remember those meetings, the, the short time of prayer before the evening service as well. If you didn't get to let the Bible speak magazine, it is there. Also, there is a sheet uh, that is available for you to take. Yeah, I have made reference to this uh, in my opening prayer about this conversion therapy. And while we do not agree, of course, with everything that is encapsulated within that term, yet the, there is a move at uh, this particular time by the sodomite agenda to uh, make it illegal for a minister or someone to pray uh, with someone who is having difficulties and problems of that nature. And they, they, they really are saying that that is uh, mentally abusive, etc. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the train of direction where that's going. And uh, this has been brought in, or uh, this has been debated in the Northern Ireland Assembly this Tuesday, brought by Doug Beatty, who's an official unit or Ulster Unionist in County Armagh. Uh, so do please take that, and what it is, it'll show you, tell you all about it, but I'll also uh, give you an idea if you want to send an email uh, to our, our MLAs uh, who will be present at that and what to say. So uh, do take it with you. It's just a page there uh, sitting on the table. Returning offering last week came to £1,562. Again, it's a tremendous offering, and £600 will, up, will be going to uh, Stephen Miller's account who was here last Sunday morning, and the rest will be going uh, to the Mainland Commission for those other works. And we say thank you again in the Lord's name. Next Sunday, I should say also, is our Building Fund Sunday, and the committee have already agreed to uh, replace uh, most of the windows in the complex. You can see that uh, they, they certainly are in need of replacing. And that order has been already made. It's going to cost somewhere in the region of 11000 And so we just leave that with you. And if you want to help towards that, we'll put it uh, in next Sunday's building fund. 
Um, we appreciate uh, everything that comes in. And uh, as I say, we've already made the order and the work will get underway, uh, God willing, at the start of the summer. Uh, but you can notice that they are fogged and all the rest of it. And uh, we do need to replace them apart from the new extension at the back. Uh, so do uh, please remember that building fund uh, next uh, Lord's Day, please. There's a Bangor online mission, 12th to the 16th of April. You can uh, tune into that this week as well. The DVDs are now available as well. Uh, if you get them out of the pigeonhole there, do take them. If you come in and out, and others, no doubt, will be delivered. And um, we're glad that they are up and running uh, again. Uh, can I also say that uh, I want to see the session just for two or three minutes after the meeting is over this morning in the prayer meeting room. That's all it'll be, brethren, just as a point of information. I think that's all by way of announcement. Um, I trust we haven't uh, forgotten anything there. 265, we'll sing, change your position before we come to the preaching of the word. Page 283, if you have the hymn book, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned, unclean. 265, let's stand as we sing.
Let me invite you to turn back to Obadiah, a little book of Obadiah. With the Word of God open, let's just seek the Lord's face this morning. We've entitled the message, Reversal of Fortunes. Reversal of Fortunes. Let's all pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy presence. Thank the Lord, we're able to sing Thy praises. We do bless Thee for the return of the Sunday school or help given to teachers and pupils alike. We pray, Lord, you'd bless this children's meeting, youth work again this week as it comes back, and the day of school as well. And we pray that thine hand will be upon our children and our young people in these days. We ask, Lord, that thou would bless the word to their heart this morning. We recognize we don't only meet with adults, but we thank thee for the children, the boys and girls, the young people. We ask, Lord, you close us in with thyself. Teach us, Lord. Give us the teachable spirit. And we pray, Lord, that we might see Christ and thou would lead us out after him. To that end, I pray, thou would fill me with thy spirit and with power. Give me that utterance of the Holy Spirit. Give me those words that must and shall prevail. For we pray these things in our Savior's name. Amen. How often in life that things turn head over heels. That is the manner in which we could describe the fortunes of both Jacob and Esau. When Jacob returned from serving his uncle Laban, he came back with his herds. The Lord had greatly blessed him. But he soon was to hear that Esau, his brother, was approaching him with 400 of his armed servants. It had all the signs of trouble and revenge. Men and women, while God dealt with the heart of Jacob at Peniel, and he limped thereafter because there was that wrestling with the angel of the covenant, God also dealt with the heart of Esau so that when they did meet, there was an embracing of each other And there was a parting on good terms. Esau going home to the country known as Edom and Jacob going towards Shechem and eventually on to Bethel. What chapter 36 of Genesis is all about, and we just read some of the opening verses, is the posterity of Esau. It takes the entire chapter to list his descendants. He is found there in that chapter, but remember this, that his posterity is material, it's not spiritual. But in that chapter 36 of Genesis, we have chiefs named, we have kings who reigned, we have descendants of Esau by name according to their regions. And all that we have about Jacob is Genesis 37 verse 1. It says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And that's it. He was a shepherd. He lived like that. And even his descendants that were to go down into Egypt were the same. But all the time, Esau is prospering. And it seems that the word of the Lord that he had said concerning uh, Jacob and Esau had been turned on its head. Remember that the Lord said of Jacob and Esau that they represented two nations. And he went on to say, and the elder shall serve the younger. That is, Esau would serve Jacob. But it doesn't look like it. It doesn't seem that God's word was being fulfilled. But today, there couldn't be any further from the truth. For as was prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel, Edom or Mount Seir is desolate. Her towns are uninhabited. It is assumed within uh, within another nation. But as for the descendants of Jacob, they're back in the land of Israel. In Genesis 36, you can take time to look at this, maybe when you get home or whatever, but five times over, Esau is identified as Edom and as the father of the Edomites. Verse 1, now these are the generations of Esau who is Edom. Verse 43, just to give you another one, Duke Magdiel, Duke Hiram, these be the Dukes of Edom according to their inhabitants. Uh, habitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father 
of the Edomites. And five times over you'll read that. Edom is found also in its own six more times. When you read of Seir, or Mount Seir, you're reading about the same place. It's mentioned five other times. And one might ask, why is the great emphasis on Mount Seir? Why is the great emphasis upon Edom? Not only because there's a special relationship between uh, the brother nations, Jacob and Esau, but also God wants you and I to see what happened to Edom and indeed what happens to any nation that forget God. That's why to give you the great geographical setting. And I'm seeking to build this picture up before we actually come to the message. The geographical setting of Edom is that it was situated in the southeast part of the land. It was east of the River Jordan, and on the eastern side of that land, it was desert. The portion of Edom was approximately 30 miles wide by 100 miles long. Its major cities were Timan and Bozra. The importance of this land was for two reasons. One, it was situated along the trade routes that the businessmen would travel from Syria in order to get down into the land of Egypt. And so therefore a great opportunity for wealth and for commerce. But secondly, its importance was its setting in terms of national security. It was full of sandstone cliffs. The people effectually were living within a natural defense because it was not a place that was easily accessible. The capital was hidden away amongst the most inaccessible highlands. It was not until David conquered the Edomites that it could be said that the older served the younger. And through the reign of Sodom, they were subjected to the descendants of Jacob. But what still remained was a bitter rivalry. And that is what we have revealed to us in the book of Obadiah. Before we come to it, to see the reversal of fortunes, it might help you to know that Edom was later to be called Edomia. When you come to the New Testament, you will see that name. As to the land today, it is within the modern state of Jordan, and it has been brought to nothing, as was prophesied by this man, Obadiah. That's why I turn you to this book. I want you to notice, first of all, the problem of sin. This short book is uttered almost entirely against Edom. You see that in the words of verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. And it, that is because the nation that Esau had founded had gone its own way. It had sinned against the Lord God. And this little book highlights for us the sin that Edom was particularly guilty of. There are two that particularly stand out. There is, first of all, it's pride. And God hates the proud look. And of course, pride leads, as it often does, to boasting. Look at the words of verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? There's their sin of pride, and their boasting. What could Adam be proud of? Well, due to her unique geographical situation that I've tried to uh, bring a little to you, Edom believed that she was almost impregnable. No one dared to attack her. Her natural defenses were the rocks and the keels. And anyone approaching the capital city had to do so through a very narrow gorge entrance in order to get into that capital city between the hills and the mountains. There are experts, those who look into history and all of that. They discovered the ancient ruins of this place, and they reckon that a dozen men could, in, in fact, hold it against a great army that were approaching. And even if the entrance was breached, then the inhabitants had the advantage of high vantage points within the city in order to launch an attack. That is why we read those words at the end of verse 3, where the Edomites said, Who shall bring me down to the ground? 
they boast of this. And humanly speaking, they thought that they had the safest spot that there ever would be to be in. But while that was true, and may have been true humanly speaking, yet there was one who could bring her down. And he said so himself. Because you go on to read in verse 4, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars. You see the, the geographical setting that is pictured. The eagle sets its nest away up on the crag of the rock. The eagle is known for that. And it's not easy, easily got to. And, and here the Lord likens Edom to the eagle. And he says, even though that be the case, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. You see, men and women, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It surely is enough to warn us against having a proud heart or having a proud spirit. We have nothing to be proud of. If we're saved today, we're sinners saved by God's grace. We're saved by God's grace, and anything that we have is because of Christ. But nothing to be proud of. The second sin which is recorded and which Edom was particularly guilty is of their unbrotherliness. What it has to do with is in acting in a manner which they ought not to have done, and especially so in their actions against their brother, that is the brother nation of Israel. Now you look at verse 10 of Obadiah. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. But thou shouldst not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. And you read on through verse 12, you see that repeated. Thou shouldst not. Thou shouldst not. In the verse 13, in the verse 14, neither shouldst thou have stood in the cross. Well, we'll look at that in a moment. These verses speak of the occasion when, when Jerusalem was overthrown by an enemy. At first, The Edomites were neutral. But then they turned to participate in the misfortune of that city. What they did was not only raid the city, but they also caught some of the people who were fleeing and they turned them back to their enemy. And this is their brother nation. You know, the psalmist makes reference to their unbrotherly behavior. Psalm 137, in the words of verse 7, It says, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem. Who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. The prophet Ezekiel has also recorded what the Lord thought of the Edomites. If you turn back a couple of books to Ezekiel chapter 35, you'll read with me in the words of verse 3. And say unto it, Verse 2 says, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir. I've told you already. You read about Seir. You're reading about Edom. Same place. Verse 3, And say unto that, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee. I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, because thou hast had a perpetual hatred. And has shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. While we cannot be certain of the exact invasion that is in focus, that is because Jerusalem as a city were invaded three or four times. Yet it serves to prove that as far as the Edomites were concerned, there was no brotherly love. There was no help shown towards those who were their brother nation, Israel. It seems apparent that that the bad blood that there was between Jacob and Esau was hard to erase. And every part, every act on the part of Edom only made the next occurrence that much easier. More intense. And here's a truth that the Lord speaks to our own hearts. You think of Matthew chapter 5, part of the great Sermon on the Mount. 
what the Savior taught. Verse 23 and 24 is just what I want to read. And it says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. What's the Lord teaching? He's teaching men and women it's useless. Useless to come to the house of God and to bring your offering of, uh, uh, and worship unto the Lord if you have something against your brother. That is the priority to get sorted out first. And then return and give your worship and your offering unto the Lord. Romans chapter 14. Let me read to you verse 15. It says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. If that's what stumble causes a brother to stumble, then we don't do it. Verse 16. Let not then your good be evil. Spoken of verse 21. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine or anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. We don't want to be a stumbling block to our brother or sister in Christ. We are to be conscious of what might offend, cause another brother to stumble. You see, men and women, the Lord expects that brotherly Love from his children. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. And as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. God's people. And Edom was guilty of pride, leading to boasting, and guilty of unbrotherliness. So, there's the problem of their sin. I want you to notice also the progression of sin here. For while the origin of sin that was in the Edomites takes us back to what happened between Esau and Jacob, yet we must understand that sin doesn't stay in the one place. It doesn't be stormant. I was going to say stormant there. <laughs> Dormant. What we note that, that also is with how they treated the nation of Israel as they made their way from Egypt. We can note this. We can see this. Remember the children of Israel coming out of the land of Goshen through the, across the Red Sea and through up through the wilderness. It was that time where Moses desired that they might pass through the land of Edom. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Verse 14, we have it. Moses sent messengers from Gadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel. See, see the brotherly nation. So Israel uh, comes from the stem of Jacob, Edom from Esau. And here's the request. Thus saith thy brother Israel. Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us. Our fathers went down into Egypt. We have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us. And our fathers, look at verse 17. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand or to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me lest I come out against thee with the sword. Verse 20, And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people, with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. The request was simple. Let us go through thy land. We're not going to stop anything that we take by way of water. We will repay thee. And Edom said, You're not doing it. If you attempt it, we'll come out with the army. We'll come out and we'll stop you. We'll prevent you. And so they did. And in these verses of Obadiah, we see the progression of Edom's sin. They were, and I bring you particularly to the words of verse uh, 11 and 12 and 13, etc. there. You see the guilt of standing aloof when their brother Israel 
stumble. Verse 11, in the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. They stood afar off. It's the first thing in the list of sins. It takes us back to that first un- uh, unbrotherly behavior in the Scriptures, that of Cain and Abel. Do you remember how Cain was angry with Abel's sacrifice being accepted? And his wrath rose within him, and he lured his brother Abel out into the fields. He rose up, and he killed him. And the Lord's presence was made known unto Cain. And he asked him, where is Abel thy brother? And the answer came back, am I my brother's keeper? Cain tried to stand aloof. And that is also what Edom was charged with. Jerusalem were threatened with the enemies and the armies coming against them. And the people of Edom said, well, it's no business of ours. We're not going to get involved in that. We're not their keepers. If they fall, well, that's what they deserve. So be it. But God says, you are your brother's keeper. Not interesting. We have a responsibility, men and women. You see, I could go back to Romans 14 that I read earlier on, and the words are verse 7. It says there, For none of us liveth unto himself. We're not an island. We have a responsibility to others around us, whether it's in the immediate uh, cons- uh, circumstance of the family, etc., but beyond that. And especially as we read in Galatians to those within the church, God holds us accountable. Where we can be of help, we ought to help. Where we can be of encouragement, we ought to encourage. So often, it's sticking the boot in when somebody's dying. And I'm using terms that we will know what I mean. That's the response that is so often seen, even among the household of faith. The second offense was that they looked down on their brother in their day of trouble. You look again at the words of verse 12. Thou stoodest not, I shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. The word looked. That is used there in verse 12 as well in verse 13 means that they looked into, they explored, they investigated or inspected. They had a special curiosity in regard to the misfortune of their fellow nation. They shouldn't have stood afar off, but they actually were curious to look into what had happened in Judah's tragedy. And so while they stood afar off and didn't help, they went further. They went to find the gory details of the fall of Judah and Jerusalem. And you know, there's some who profess faith in Jesus Christ, and they're just like that. They'll not help, but they aren't against finding out every last detail of someone's fall, of someone's misfortune. According to the prophet Obadiah, that's a sin. And it ought not to be named amongst us. We should not have that unhealthy attitude of seeking to know details about another brother or sister's fall into sin. If any be overtaken with the fall, we which are spiritual, Galatians 6 remind us, are to seek to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. The third sin, which is again a progression, is found in the latter part of verse 12. And it says that neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of of Judah. The reaction may be understandable, especially because of the long time conflict there was between the two nations. Where they're at is the case between individuals, between nations, between churches. The one in trouble is looked upon with glee and happiness by the other. That's what Edom were guilty of. Progression of sin. Then to follow on to that, there's a boasting. Verse 12, Neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. The boasting grows from the spirit of pride. 
It's closely related to gloating over another misfortune. There is a boasting because we think ourselves to be better. Ah, you can see Jerusalem. They've been overcome by the enemy. They've been attacked. Look at us. We're saved. We're better. You ever been there? You ever boasted, maybe not with words, but certainly in spirit, with gladness that you were better than that other person had fallen into some sin? It ought not to be so. There's no difference. No difference. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Lord had to lift us by His same grace in salvation. If you have not fallen into some sin that some other person has, then there ought to be a humble thanksgiving to God that you were spared. Not the spirit of pride, boasting. The fifth one, verse 13, Thou shouldst not have entered into the gates of my people in the day of their calamity. So they march through the city. First of all, stand aloof. But then they go in to look at the gory details and they march through the gates of the Jerusalem in the day of their calamity, the day of the people's trouble. The next one is seen in the same verse is that they seized upon even their substance. Neither shouldst thou uh, have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. They laid hands upon the substance. The seventh one. The last one is verse 14. Neither shouldst thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldst thou have delivered up those of us that did remain in the day of distress. What it tells us is that they went and they stood at the crossroads. And when there were those who fled out of the city from the enemy, they laid hold upon them and they rounded them up and they handed them back to the enemy. And this actually shows that the Edomites, instead of being a help, they hindered their fellow people. They rounded them up. They proceeded to deliver them back to those whom they were fleeing from. How callous can you get? Their actions should not be named amongst the people of God. And yet surely there are those who spend more time serving the enemy and serving the devil by delivering believers into the hands of unbelievers. And they do in serving the Lord. You see, dear people, the Lord desires that each one of us would be a means of building up believers in their faith, not putting them down. Ephesians 4 and verse 16 uses the analogy of the body. It says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the factual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There is the desire on God's part that we individual believers might edify other believers within the body that we might be a help, that we might be that encouragement, that we might give them that hand to lift them up, not to engage in the progression of sin of which Edom was guilty of. I want to bring our meeting to a close by showing you this morning also the prophecy of the Savior here. I believe we have noted that the sin of Edom that had its beginning in Esau, also worked itself into the succeeding generations and flowed on into their history. And that's why Edom will be brought down by the Lord. But the closing verses of Obadiah offer an entirely different perspective. For they prophesy of one who should come who would not be like them. You look at the words of verse 17 and 18. It says, but, that, that's telling. That changes the tone. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. 
and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. The day was coming when there would be a confrontation. There would be that day when two kings would meet. Two kings who would confront each other for the first time. They'd never met each other before, but the day had come when they would meet. On that very pinnacle of power would be one sitting on his throne. He would be called Herod. He was the son of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was an Edomite. And who was he? He was the Herod who ordered the death of all the baby boys. Two years and under in in Bethlehem. So that he might include within his culling. The killing of Christ the Christ child. That's who he was. And now his son is reigning and he's no better because he was one who ordered even the beheading of John the Baptist. He had everything materially he would want. But yet when he stood before this other king, we read that he answered him not a word. Because the other king was the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's a descendant of Jacob, not Edom. And he is one after the flesh who was the heir to the throne of David. But according to the divine purpose of God, he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. And you see this confrontation. And Herod longed for this day in which Christ would do some miracle. Yet he answered him not a word. didn't look like a king. He was dressed in humble clothing. He was rejected by the multitudes. The cry was away with him. And why within a short time he would die on a rugged cross. For you see, men and women, there was Calvary before this king. He could have called forth the legions of angels in order to deliver him. He could have taken Herod off his throne, he, but he did not come to set up his kingdom that way or in that manner. He came to die for sinners. Why? So that we, sinners saved by grace, might one day reign with him in his kingdom. And to that end he came. And so on that cross, he purchased eternal redemption for all who will come to him by faith and belief. That sacrifice for sin. And if Obadiah doesn't teach us what I've already covered, listen, it teaches us that sin must be punished. God is a holy God. But that sacrifice for sin that Christ offered on the cross, it was acceptable in the Father's sight. The third day he rose again. And today uh, this king lives forevermore. And he reigns and one day is coming back to set up his kingdom. And all the kingdoms of the earth shall be the kingdoms of Christ. He's coming back for his people who in the meantime by his spirit enables his people to live in this earth as they should We can't do that of ourselves. We need the help of the Holy Spirit every day to help us to live as Christ would have us live. What about Herod? What about that other king? All his wealth, all his pleasure gained him nothing. But the history books tell us that he was banished. And he died in misery. A king who died in misery. I wonder which is it going to be for you today as we draw our meeting to a close. As the choice is laid out before you, there is the way of sin or there is the way of salvation. There's the way of Herod. 
the Edomite, or there is the way of Christ, the descendant of Jacob. Which is it going to be? You cannot have both. And if your end is to be different from Herod, then you must seek Christ and be part of his kingdom. You see, that's how Obadiah ends, the last verse. And Savior shall come up on the Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. I want every one of you to be part of that kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord's. Many are already in, but what about you? Trust you'll come and seek Christ even this morning. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer in closing. Our Father and our God, we thank Thee for Thy Word. We bless Thee, Lord, for even this little book of Obadiah. And maybe, Lord, one that we wouldn't run to, but, O oh God, we thank Thee for the lessons and the truths therein. We recognize, Lord, that it speaks of the descendants of Esau. And, oh God, how fortunes were turned on their head. Lord, the elder truly would serve the younger. And we praise the Lord for the promise of the Savior, the Savior who would come, who would be deliverance in Mount Zion. And Lord, we thank Thee for the de deliverance at Calvary, outside the city walls. We thank the Lord there Prince of life laid down his life as a sinner's substitute that he might purchase eternal life for all his people. O oh God, we pray even today, thou would teach us, and thou would speak to the unconverted, that they might, Lord, make that preparation, they might come and enter into the kingdom of Christ. O oh, give that deciding grace, that repentance, we pray. Speak on with the preacher's voices and part us now with thy blessing and thy fear. For we ask these things in our Savior's precious name. Amen.